Hey guys, it's Kat the Lava Girl, and today I'm going to be counting down 19 consoles that I bet you've never heard of before. So, without any further ado, let's get started. The Nintendo PlayStation. You heard me right. You don't need to rewind the Nintendo PlayStation. Before the Xbox, Microsoft worked together with Sega during the making of the Dreamcast, and Sony did something similar with Nintendo back in the early 90s. Dubbed the Nintendo PlayStation, the console was discovered by a former Advanta employee named Terry Diebold. More than a decade later, he auctioned it off and sold it for $360,000. The Atari Cosmos Atari was one of the most successful video game companies out there. However, the company had a major weakness, handhelds. They just could not make a handheld that even held a candle to Nintendo's Game Boys. They tried, though. The Atari Cosmos was in development for three years until it was canceled in 1981. Although the Cosmos was never released, five prototypes exist, but three of them are just empty shells, like the picture I have here. One of these shells was sold on eBay in 2005 and sold for $18,853. The Halcyon is an unreleased console made by RDI Video Systems. The system was planned to be released in January 1985, with initial retail price for the system being a staggering $2,500. Only 10 are known to exist, and it never reached stores because of limited affordable disc players. Sega Genesis CDX Sega combined their Genesis and Sega CD into one console called the Genesis CDX. It sold for $400 at release, and its expensive price led to poor sales. The Sony PSX, no, I'm not talking about the original PlayStation, was one of the earliest attempts to turn a console into a multimedia device. Released exclusively in Japan, the PSX was a digital video recorder with a fully integrated PS2 gaming console. The PSX could connect to a cable TV or be linked to a PSP. It could also play DVDs and CDs. Despite all these features, the PSX was a failure because it cost nearly $1,000. Nintendo 64 DD. As I'm sure you know, the Nintendo 64 uses cartridges, but in 1996, PlayStation announced new CD technology, and Nintendo did not want to look outdated in comparison. The 64 DD was a disk drive peripheral released in Japan only in 1996. Sadly, it was a massive failure. Fortunately, the more of a failure something is, the more rare it is. Sharp Super Famicom TV. Also known as the Super Famicom Naizu TV SF1, this was a collaboration between TV manufacturer Sharp and Nintendo and was a television with a built-in SNES. The console buttons were located on the lower part of the TV along with the controller ports and the cartridge slot was located on the top. The Famicom TV advertised better image quality than having a separate console and a separate TV. Oddly enough, the Super Famicom TV is much more rare than the other Sharp Nintendo collaboration that featured an NES inside a TV. Sega Iwa Mega CD The Sega Genesis CDX wasn't the only time that Sega tried to mash together a game console with a disc-based music player. The Iowa Mega CD crammed a console into a boombox, allowing you to play Mega Drive and Mega CD games on a CD radio. The Iowa Mega CD is an oddity in no small part to the fact that the radio and console portions weren't actually integrated. The device came in two chunks that sat atop one another and even had to be connected with a cable. Much like the CDX, the Iowa Mega CD is also technically compatible with the Sega 32X, but that compatibility is even more of a stretch since the cartridge port is located on the bottom. To actually fit a 32X into the console, you need to turn it to its side very awkwardly. Fairchild Channel F. Despite being a failure, the Fairchild Channel F actually helped shape the future of video games. It was the first home console to use cartridge-based games like the Nintendo Switch and Nintendo 3DS. Before, all video game consoles came with games in them already. However, the basic message didn't get across to the Fairchild Channel F. The games that work with your console are supposed to be fun. The games for the Fairchild Channel F got boring after a few minutes of playing. The Epoch Cassette Vision the Epoch Cassette Vision is one of those consoles that you look at and say to yourself, what were they thinking? Its controllers are built into the console itself, meaning that players had to play with the entire console on their lap. You're better off playing single player too. To play with someone else, you'll have to put the console and controllers between yourselves and sit in an awkward half-turned position as you play.
The Vectrex. The Vectrex is, uh, well, I mean, it's interesting. The Vectrex actually came with its own display, but instead of actually having a screen that could display color like everybody else, the Vectrex decided to be unique and quirky and came with a bunch of colored plastic that would turn the black and white graphics into green, red, pink, blue, or any other color tint. Atari Lynx. Unlike the Game Boy, which came out the exact same year the Lynx did, the Lynx had a backlit color screen, something the Game Boy wouldn't have until nine years later. But the Lynx struggled with getting a good library of games. I believe that if they just had a better library of games, the Lynx would have definitely outdone the Game Boy. Philips CDI. Alright, just by looking at this thing, this thing looks so boring and so cheap and clunky. I mean, look at this thing. Ew. Did you really have high expectations for it? Like the Fairchild Channel F, the Philips CDI was revolutionary, but still a failure. The Philips CDI was the first video game console to support games on compact discs, but it was marketed as more of a home entertainment system rather than a video game console. It is also the only non-Nintendo console to ever feature Nintendo-exclusive games, including Link the Faces of Evil and Hotel Mario. Don't get excited about these games, though. One critic said, These games look like an animated version of an off-brand coloring book. Another said, Goodness gracious, if these games had a taste, they would taste like an ear infection. Pioneer Laser Active Laser discs are like the HD DVDs to Blu-ray. Laser discs were competing with VHS tapes. And they lost because... I have never heard of a laser disc until I started researching for this video. <laughs> the Pioneer Laser Active not only supported games on the laser disc format, but it also cost nearly $1,000. It was a great console, but unfortunately it went with the wrong format. The 3DO. Unlike most other game consoles, the 3DO could be made by any company that licensed a design from the 3DO company. Because of this, the 3DO was kind of like a DVD or CD player. Depending on which company was manufacturing it, the 3DO would differ. This mixed with its early use of disc-based games, its staggering price, and its push to be a multimedia player set it up for failure. Sega 32X The Sega 32X was an add-on for the Sega Genesis that plugged into the cartridge slot, which allowed it to play games that the Genesis couldn't. It was kind of an awkward transition between the Sega Genesis and the successful Sega Saturn. It didn't sell well because a lot of people didn't really understand how to use it or what it did, and most people just wanted to wait for the Sega Saturn. The 32X only having 34 games in a time period of two years didn't help its case either. Gamecom. Even though it's spelled game.com, the dot is silent. It was made by Tiger Electronics, and it was the DS's shady uncle that everyone in the family just kind of avoids and forgets. It was a handheld video game console that came with a touch screen and a stylus. Additionally, the GameCom was sort of like an office assistant because it had a built-in calculator, calendar, and an address book. It could also connect to the internet when it was connected to a modem. Yeah, something most people didn't have in 1997. And the only thing you could do on the internet, on the GameCom, is send an email or look at a text-only version of a website. Though it featured some innovative design ideas that would later become standard in Nintendo handheld consoles, the GameCom was a flop and Tiger decided to turn its focus toward other consumer electronics. Like Furbies. N-Gage. The N-Gage was a combination of a phone and a handheld gaming device. One of its biggest problems was that you had to remove the battery in order to switch games. Also, the bad placement of the speaker meant that users had to hold the edge of the phone against their ear, which Fortune Magazine stated that it made it look like they were talking into a taco. Gizmondo The Gizmondo was a handheld gaming console that's main feature is its ability to track users through GPS. One game, called Colors, would have players guard real-life locations in their neighborhoods from other players like the gyms and Pokemon Go. The other reason that Gizmondo is so cool is because the story behind the people who made it. One of his executives, Stefan Eriksson, got tons of attention from the media 
after crashing a Ferrari Enzo at nearly 200 miles per hour, which led to U.S. authorities discovering that he had ties to the Swedish Mafia. These events certainly weren't the only thing holding back Gizmondo, but they definitely didn't help. The company that made Gizmondo went bankrupt within a year of releasing the console in very limited amounts, selling fewer than 25,000 units and vanishing off the face of the earth.